time for you guys. I do want to encourage you. I really want to know some of your answers to these. So if you would just email me, call me, text me, I would love to hear what God's been doing on your heart in these past few weeks and kind of uh, share what God's been doing on this side as well uh, at the Chrysham household. Um, so if you would email me those, that would be great. With that, we're going to go ahead and jump into John chapter 11. So if you have your Bibles, get those ready. Um, but before that, we're going to go ahead and lift this time up to the Lord in prayer because we need to stop before we do anything and just kind of get in that right posture by just lifting it up to the Lord and inviting him in during this time. So would you join me in prayer? God, we come before you just in a time of change, in a time of craziness, in a time that is very different for a lot of us, Lord. God, it's a time of insecurity. It's a time of fears and, and uncertainty, Lord. And just in all of it, we know that you are still on the throne and that you are still God. And we are so thankful that here in this place, God, we can come together and open your word and learn about what it means to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we can learn about what it means to follow you more, that we can learn more about our hearts and kind of the things that are pulling us away from you, that we might put those to death and just run towards you with everything and surrender and trust in you more freely, Lord Jesus. God, we pray that you would be with this time, Lord. Would you just calm our hearts, just allow us to be receptive for the word that you have for us today, Lord. God, I pray that you would use me as your servant, use me as your tool, Lord, that I would just be a testimony to the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, that it would be immediately pointing people back to you. God, would you allow me to deliver your word to your people in this place, Lord, as you deliver your word to my heart that needs it just as badly. God, we love you and we thank you for your mercy and your kindness in your holy, precious name. Amen. Amen, you guys. You guys, thank you so much for joining us. I'm excited that we are here closing out our series through the Gospel of John. Uh, we really have two weeks left. It's going to be Palm Sunday, and it's going to be Easter Sunday, but this is kind of closing out just the Gospel of John series, and then we're going to go into kind of those two weeks as the final cap of it. Um, one announcement I forgot to mention to you guys is that next week is Palm Sunday. So we really were kind of racking our brains, and we came up with something really creative— Palm Sunday, Palm Sun, Tropical Week. So um, just in an effort to try and create something fun for us as a church, uh, we want to encourage you guys to wear your best tropical clothing that is appropriate um, and join us on Zoom so we can kind of celebrate together and just continue to focus on the Word of God. That will absolutely be the focus of next week's uh, kind of time together, that we're just going to soak and rest and walk in discipleship with one another. Um, but we just want to do some fun things together uh, as we are limited without being able to be physically together. We just want to celebrate that way. So wear your tropical gear next week for Palm Sunday, um, and we're going to enjoy a time of worship and the proclamation of the Word of God. It's going to be great. Um, with that, um, I, I want to introduce today's sermon title because it's a little weird. It's called Insufficient Funds. And we're not talking about insufficient funds as your bank account, which might cause some panic in you guys when you see that. Um, I'm talking about a different kind of insufficient funds. Because what I've noticed, either from myself or looking on social media or different things like that, is that quarantine has revealed something very interesting about our hearts. You, you see, in this time of quarantine, um, we've actually realized that we've been writing a lot of checks that we can't necessarily cash. We, we don't have the funds to cash what we've been writing, if that makes sense. We're, we're, we're about to bounce a lot of checks because for the past decade for some of us, multiple decades for others of us, or, or even just a couple years, we've been telling people, you know, I just, I don't have a lot of time. If I just had time, if I got the gift of time, I would read so many books. Man, yeah, I, I, I know I should work out, but, but really I just can't work out because I just don't have the time. Well, yeah, I know, I mean, obviously the word of God is there. The Bible's important and everything, but, but I just don't have the time. If, if you knew my schedule, I'm just so busy. I'm just running around all the time. I don't have any time to read the word of God. And then we were quarantined in our homes. And suddenly all those checks that you wrote, people are trying to cash those saying, hey, what happened to uh, you getting around to reading all those books? What happened to you getting in the word and, and having that quiet time? Hey, what happened to you working out, Kate? Um, yeah, that was Kate to me. But no, well, whatever it is, there's all these checks that are now being cashed, and we don't have the sufficient funds. Because what quarantine has revealed about us is that it really wasn't about our circumstances. It was a heart issue. You see, our circumstances weren't the reason that we weren't doing all these things. We were just making excuses for it. Maybe we didn't even know that ourselves, but the truth was we never had the sufficient funds because there, there's some heart stuff to deal with underneath that. 
especially when it comes to the spiritual side of things. You see, if you're lacking in your quiet time, which looks different to different people, or you're lacking in getting in the word of God, there's a heart issue behind that. Because if it's a priority, if it's the most important thing is your relationship with Jesus, then a lot of other things would be taking that back seat versus this. But it's revealed something. And what it's revealed is kind of this main theme that we're going to look at today, and that is what we see, what we say, and what we do is determined less by our circumstances and more by our hearts. What we see, what we say, and what we do is determined less by our circumstances and far more by our hearts. That's what we're going to see here in John chapter 11. This is going to be the last miracle that Jesus performs before the the Jewish leaders actually decide that they're going to plot to kill him. This is the straw that broke the camel's back. This is the final thing. And and what a great way to go out because Jesus is actually going to raise someone from the dead. And this is the moment when they say, this man is too much of a threat to us. We need to get him killed. We need to remove him from the picture altogether. And in that, we see that these circumstantial excuses, these these things that are going on around are, are, are far less the point. And the point is our hearts. The point is, what's beyond that? What's behind that? So I want to walk you through this passage today. And and obviously, you guys are going to hear this, and you're going to say, well, well, doesn't this mean this too? Yes, whenever you preach a passage, there's a lot of different things that that passage has going on. And if you were to spend time, you could go probably verse by verse throughout the Bible, and it would take you decades. But, But just through this lens is how I want to look at this passage today. Because I think it's very helpful for us in this time of, of COVID-19 and quarantine and, and all these things that we're looking at our circumstances and, and so much has come to the surface. I just want to look at it through that lens. So if you guys would open your Bibles to John chapter 11, we're going to be starting in verse 17. John chapter 11, verse 17. I'll give you guys a second to go there as I drink from my image coffee mug. Mm. John 11, verse 17. I have to get there myself. (laughs) It says, Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Mary and Martha to console them concerning their brother. So when Mary heard, so when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she had heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still the place where Martha had met him. And when the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. The shortest verse in the Bible, it records Jesus' response. It says two words, Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? This is such a fascinating passage, and and there's so much going on here. If you guys remember our sermon last weekend, we talked about Jesus healing the blind man, showing that he has this divine power over life and death. He has this divine power to to heal people and, and to do amazing things. And when he hears of the death of his friend Lazarus, before this, it says that he stayed an extra two days before he left on his journey. And it's very confusing to know why Jesus would respond here. When he arrives to the scene, this man had already been dead for four days. And he's there to console Mary and Martha. 
And the people are, are even saying, could this man not have come early and stopped this? I mean, he, he made a man who was blind from birth see. He clearly has power. Could he have not stopped this man from dying? And there's so much hurt. And there's so much grief going on. And for those who know this passage, it's about to change. Because Jesus is going to raise Lazarus from the dead. And it's going to be incredible, but, but, but that's not where he focuses because that might be the circumstances, but, but Jesus actually focuses on the heart behind the circumstances. What I want you to see, point number one, is that Jesus offers his comfort to us regardless of circumstances. Jesus' compassion and comfort is offer, offered regardless of circumstances. You see, Jesus kind of outlines this thing as he's talking with Mary that, yes, there is future victory to be had, but, but in the present there is suffering and pain. And he offers his comfort in the midst of that. You see, Jesus knows he's about to raise Lazarus from the dead, um, but, but in the meantime, he wept because there was compassion for the suffering that was going on then. There, there's two things that are going on here. The first is that... Lazarus' death reminded Jesus that this is not the way it was meant to be. That sin entered, changing the world, that God had created a perfect world, and in our rebellion, we broke it with sin. And things like death exist where they did not exist before. Things like COVID-19 exist where they did not exist before. Things like cancer exist where they did not exist before. Things like dementia exist where they did not exist before. And the compassion of Jesus is on full display here as he comes to Mary and Martha and himself weeping over the loss of his friend, Lazarus. But more importantly than, than his compassion and the comfort that he offers regardless of circumstances, he's going to go on to this next incredible and powerful thing showing that he has the power over life and death. That this word who is in the beginning with God that John set up in chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. That guy, Jesus, is about to raise this man from the dead. He is both compassionate and caring and comforting regardless of circumstances and he holds the power of life and death in his hands. And I'm telling you today, his compassion and his comfort is offered to you regardless of your circumstances. If you are a Christian and you are clinging to the hope of tomorrow, of a future victory, reigning and ruling with King Jesus for eternity, yes and amen, and I love that, but I want you to know that in the middle of it right now, Jesus is there with you. His compassion and his comfort is there with you as you are hurting and struggling and asking questions that, that I don't have the answer to, that you don't have the answer to, that we don't have the answer to. He is there with you. And he will be there with you in the future, regardless of circumstances, in the highs, in the lows, in the peaks, in the valleys, in the victories, and what feels like the most loss ever. And what I want you to know is that none of it is meaningless. There's not one ounce of pain, not one thing that you have gone through or will go through or are currently going through that will be not be used for the glory of the kingdom of God that will not be redeemed for the glory of the kingdom of God. God is working so many things out. That's why I wanted you guys to look at this question to say, yes, we all know the stuff that this has caused that is negative, but what is God redeeming it to in your life? We broke the world, and God is actively, ongoingly in the process of restoring it to himself. And if you would just look around, you, you would see glimpses of it here and glimpses of it there. This compassionate God who made you and me is restoring a broken world to himself and piece by piece putting it back together. And he doesn't ask for you to be perfect or white knuckle. He asks for you to surrender and let him do what he has created this world to function as. Let him do what only he can do to piece by piece restore your heart by surrendering more fully in Jesus Christ. Let's keep reading in verse 38. <clears throat> After this, it says, Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an order. He has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. 
And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they might believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen stripped and his face wrapped with cloth. Jesus said to him, unbind him and let him go. I don't know if you guys caught that, but that's incredible. That moment right there, a man who had been dead for four days, rotting in a tomb to the point where his loved one said, don't even bother, the odor would overcome us if you open that tomb. And it is in that that Jesus comes and brings hope, brings life, brings victory, and over the most final thing that every human being up to that point and since that point has experienced, death. The only thing that is final in our lives is that if you are alive, one day you will expire. And what Jesus did right now is show that he has the power over life and death. That is the Lord that we can follow. Not a Lord that is limited to say, well, I can be your king, but only for about 80 years or so until my body breaks down and and it's really going to be a temporary kingdom and and your body's going to break down too. That's not a king worth following, really. The king worth following is the one who has eternal life, who won, the one who has an everlasting kingdom, the one who was there before the beginning with God, who was God, who, who has no beginning and has no end, the eternal son of God. And that is what Jesus just proved himself to be. And what I love about this point number two, they were all given the same sign and the same circumstances to believe in God. I mean, you and I, we love to blame our circumstances, don't we? I mean, you you can listen to any court case. It's always, um, well, officer, I I know the speed limit was posted, but um, I'm a special situation. I I have different circumstances. That's that's why I was speeding. You see, my my foot had a cramp. Whatever it is, we, we love to blame our circumstances because then we don't have to take personal responsibility. And right here, Jesus in this one situation has leveled the circumstances for everyone here. And their response is going to reveal something about their heart. We're going to get to that in just a minute. But what I want you guys to see is just like the Bible says in Romans 1, that his divine attributes and eternal power have been clearly perceived since the beginning of time so that we are without excuse, that that they have the same circumstances and that we have the same circumstances. You see, God has revealed himself to us through the things that have been created through each and every person in your homes right now watching. You are made in the image of God and you are bearing his signature. Just to look at the complexities and intricacies of our world, whether it be a mountainscape or a flower or or each and every one of you, just look at the human eye and the way that it works. All of it bears the signature of our creator. His divine attributes and eternal power have been clearly perceived through the things that have been created so that we are without excuse. Listen, we can try and blame God for for why we're not being good disciples, why we're not being obedient, why we really don't believe in him, why we've decided not to follow him. If that's you today, you can blame your circumstances all you want, but the truth is that God has given us all the circumstances. He has offered the same invitation through Jesus Christ. That if you just admit that you're a sinner, believe in Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life for the forgiveness of your sin, confess him as Lord, just surrender. It's going to be messy. It's going to be imperfect. You are going to struggle with it. But if you would just surrender yourself, pick up your cross daily and follow him, you can have eternal life here and now and for eternity with King Jesus. And you will begin to demonstrate that in the way that you love God and love the people around. Man, that is the offer for each and every person here from the person who's studied under a great preacher their entire lives, for the person who's studied under a heretic for their entire lives, for for the person who's never heard a preacher in their entire lives, who just looks at the things that have been created and asks themselves, there there, there must be a God. I want to know this God. He has revealed himself to us through the person and work of Jesus Christ. And he's invited you, Christian, in to be a part of this, to go and share the good news so that people can hear it directly so that you can just be excited to tell people he wants you to be the vessel by which he communicates his love to the world. Do you understand what a powerful, powerful thing that is, that you have been invited into this kingdom? Not because God needs you, his hands are tied behind his back and you're something great, you're you're all-star quarterback. No, 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 he's invited in you, as broken as you are, 
me, as broken as I am, as messy as it is to use us, imperfect people, he invites us in to be a part of his kingdom work. And that is good news, that we are here and that we have the same circumstances and that God is inviting and pulling just like he found you, he's inviting and pulling the world and we get to go be the heralds of the good news to testify about Jesus Christ. So they, they all have the same circumstances. The, the, the playing field is level, but we're going to read their responses are very different. Let's pick it back up in verse 45. After this, it says, Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. Great. They're the ones who got the A, right? But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and Pharisees gathered the council and said, what are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go like this, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away our place in our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was a high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who were scattered abroad. So from that day, they made plans to put him to death. You see, these people had the same encounter with Jesus. They saw him perform the same signs and the same miracles. They had the same circumstances. So if you're listening to this and you're just waiting for God to move in your life, you're just saying, well, if God would just give me a sign, then I would believe in him. This passage would actually tell you that when God moves, it, your heart is on full display. You see, these people had the same circumstance, but they had three very different responses, didn't they? Same exact scenario. They watched Jesus raise a man from the dead. One group followed him. The other group told on him. They were skeptical and scared, so they reported him to the Pharisees. And the third group was so afraid that he was genuine, that they would lose the approval of man, that they would lose their position and their power and all these idols that they had built up. They made a plot to kill him. It wasn't that they didn't believe that he was genuine. They actually said, look, he keeps being genuine and everyone's going to follow him. Why is that a bad thing? It's not. Unless you built up all these idols and you're comforting yourself with the approval of man, with a little bit of extra money from here, a little bit of praise from here, maybe a little political power and, and persuasion, and maybe a, a little palace you can be comfortable in. And then Jesus comes, and he starts to change things. He starts to rearrange things in your heart. And just like the Pharisees, you make plans to kill and eradicate and shut down the gospel at every return. And these people had the same encounter with Jesus. And they either followed him or they turned on him and tried to kill him. Man, I, I'm just telling you, if you are here waiting for the, if God would just, then I would fill in the blank. I want you to know that he has already done it through the person and work of Jesus Christ. It, it, it's already done. He sent his son to accomplish all of it. It is up to you now to respond. The invitation has been sent. There is no waiting for him to move. He has already moved. So what are you going to do? What is going to be your next step? Man, if you have truly encountered Jesus, you cannot be neutral. You are either going to love him or hate him. Listen, if you think he's just some guy, listen to the teachings he says. If you want to follow me, you're going to have to pick up your cross. You remember what a cross was in the time of Rome? It was the most brutal torture device known to man, the most gruesome way to kill someone. He says, pick up your cross daily and follow me. He says, if anyone wants to follow me and be my disciple, they're going to have to hate their mom, their dad, and even their own selves compared to how much they love me. That's what it means to be a follower and a disciple of Jesus. Eat my flesh, drink my blood. Listen, if he's not Lord, he's a madman and you really must hate him. If you don't believe he's the Lord, then, then you would want to put him to death. But if he's the Lord, that changes everything. You see, the only way that you come to belief in Jesus is that if he does something in your heart, 
You see these, these circumstances, these encounters with Jesus, it's not about our circumstances. It reveals something about our heart. And our heart is dead in our trespasses until God, the creator of the universe, sends the Holy Spirit to begin that work of regeneration, to begin putting that heart back together piece by piece. What sin had destroyed, he begins to redeem and restore that back to himself that you can walk in right relationship. And the moment that you surrender to Jesus, his righteousness is on you. God looks at you as the perfection of his son. It was all absorbed on the cross. That is the invitation for you today. And if you're here and you feel the Holy Spirit tugging on your heart, I want you to know if you are not a Christian, that is the work of regeneration beginning in your heart. And I urge you, I beg with you, I plead with you, do not ignore it. Text us, email us, call us, comment on the link, get in touch with us so that we can walk through this. This is good news. This is not conviction like the conviction of the world. The world convicts you and you are sentenced to death. God convicts you to invite you into life. That is a big difference, amen? You see, the God of the universe is inviting you in to be a part of the greatest drama of all time. And if you feel that urging, if you feel the Holy Spirit doing something in your heart, do not let it go another moment without reaching out to someone to talk about King Jesus and how you can surrender your life to him. This isn't because you need someone else to become a Christian. It is by faith alone, through grace alone. This is because we are not meant to walk alone. We are meant to be a body of believers. That's why we're trying so hard to gather together through Zoom to see you guys every weekend. Because it's not about just shouting at you into a camera. This is about us gathering together as a body of believers. We are a family united in Christ. And man, I know uh, most of our members are, are followers of Christ. They profess Jesus as Lord. And I want you to know if you feel this tugging on your heart too, this is good news. If you feel like at the end of this, you've written some spiritual checks that you haven't been able to cash in and you feel that kind of burden, I want you to know that that is God revealing some wickedness in your heart, some latent idolatry, some something, not to condemn you. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He is doing that so that he can invite you to a better way. He's inviting you to life. He's invited you to walk in the way that he has created you. And man, that's good news. So once again, I encourage you, find a brother, find a sister, find someone to walk with, reach out to us. Me and Kate are always a listening ear for you guys to kind of talk to and, and walk with and grow with. We just want to encourage you guys, do not let this go by. And just walk together. Man, insufficient funds, let's redeem that for good. Insufficient funds. That's, that's something that, that strikes panic into our hearts. When you see that on the little credit card thing, when, you, when you're going through insufficient funds, that's something that's negative. But here, if God is telling us there's insufficient funds, that is him showing us something in our heart that needs to be fixed. That is the, the surgeon who finds the problem and says, I have a cure for that. Surrender more of yourself to me. And we're going to work on that. And we're going to fix it because you are not meant to walk in darkness. In fact, you have been set free from the bondage of sin and shame, and you're going to walk in the freedom that I made you for. Thank you for just stepping forward in obedience and surrendering yourself more. Let's pray. God, thank you so much just for allowing us to just open your word, Lord, and, and hopefully become better disciples of you. God, we thank you for the work of the cross. God, I know that I've been blessed by this message, but Lord, I don't want to be selfish. I pray that this message has blessed each and every person that is here with us this morning. God, I pray that, that, that we would be faithful disciples, obedient to just share the gospel with the world, Lord. God, give us opportunities and give us the power to follow through on those opportunities. God, us allow us to be a light that shines your name and your love in our communities, in our homes, from six feet away, wherever we are, Lord. May we shine your light in this place. And may we tell people about your son, Jesus. God, we love you and we thank you in your holy, precious name.
Amen. You guys, thank you so much for joining us this morning. I just want to remind you one more time that next week um, we will not be doing the 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. service. Instead, we're going to have one 1030 a.m. service where you guys can join us here on the Zoom meeting. Um, you guys can also stream Facebook, uh, YouTube, wherever we have it, our site, themhla.com slash live. Um, just want to let you know we will have one service, 1030 a.m. next week, you guys. Thank you so much once again. Uh, we love you guys. We'll see you Wednesday night.